May I remind you of the next two uh, speakers, Anne Lise Lagarde on March the 8th and Jonas Dahlberg on March the 22nd. The speaker this evening, as you know, is David Clairbou. I don't know where I was when I first saw something that I took to be a film. It was, there was a ball in the air and there were lots of people and they moved around, there were adults, there were children. And then suddenly I realized the ball hadn't moved at all. And I couldn't work this out, but it has stuck in my mind for many, many years and it still remains my favorite piece. Um, you may have, have seen it in London. David Tabu has said, photographs are films that keep their mouths shut. I think it's worth pondering that statement. His work in some sense lies between film and photographs. He subverts the time of the photograph and he disrupts the movement of film. He produces his own kind of movement from the surface of still images. We think of the photograph as a still image and we think of film as moving image. Film, of course, has its own notion of continuity. But Clairbou wants to reinvent the meaning of continuity. He would like three prints from three different times, before, now, and after, to be able to occupy the same surface, the same picture. He has a well-known work, it's the one I just described, Sections of a Happy Moment, in which a point in time and the course of time are woven into one, where he draws out a moment one moment for 26 minutes. The audience experiences a strange virtual movement, although time isn't really going by, in what Francoise Parfait has called an astonishing manufacture of the real. I realize that what I am saying is not entirely comprehensible. It seems unimaginable that one could invest the photograph with the future and deprive film of its here and now. I hope David Clairbou will say something about his use of the digital in unlocking the flow of time from a static situation. You may have seen the work I've been talking about. It has been in shows from Paris to San Francisco, and you may well have seen it in London at Hauser and Worth in 2009 and at Parasol Unit last year. Currently, he's working on some new projects that use animation and 3D techniques. And I believe he will tell us more about this work this evening. Please welcome David. Thank you. I have a, a rather, I'm rather soft spoken, so give me a sign if this is not um, loud enough. And um, I, I should say maybe a few words about how I came to do what I do today. And that is uh, by being, um, an amateur and an autodidact. I taught myself most of the things that I practice today. And in fact, I come from an, a rather uh, conventional uh, background. I ran academy for most of my young life, um, trained as a painter, lithographer, etching. And um, <coughs> Basically, by the time when I was uh, 22, 23, I was totally and utterly depressed with all the stuff that I had been doing for since age eight, nine. I sort of had the feeling that I had been running through everything, all the cycles that had could be fed to young artists as examples of history, mainly in painting, and um, always felt I was running behind the facts. And so my, uh, basically my um, student time is one full of frustration and uh, with a, s a profound sense of coming too late. And um, I think um, I got out of that at one point. Um, well, I in initially I, s I, s I stuck into it um, and I actually became a master lithographer. I became somebody who does prints uh, for other artists, but I was mainly working for myself. Um, but the technique and the procedure related 
um, um, things that are uh, surrounding graphics and uh, traditional graphics were my thing. And I think I carried this kind of fascination for indirect working, uh, not immediately seeing the result of the image, not immediately seeing the picture uh, with me. And this suited me quite well when I started working with, with uh, um, uh, always new technologies, at least for me. And um, this is something that continues up to today, is that I'm always curious to find uh, the things that are over the horizon, um, both technically, but I don't really make a distinction between a picture or a work and the way it's made. It's sort of one thing, it's one magical um, coincidence. On occasion it goes wrong, but it's actually quite rare, I hope. And so, um, around the age of 24, 25, I became my own master, so to speak. And I did so by actually not doing anything at all for several years. And um, because I had, as so many painters today, in fact most, my uh, imaginary world was mainly dependent on photography. I had actually gathered a lot of material by that time. And um, in that material was a lot of architectural photography. And I, still up to this day, I don't know exactly why that is. Um, but I do have something with buildings being photographed right after they have been inaugurated or when they sort of still represent the youth of a, a way of thinking in an architect. And um, photography is magical in that sense that it shows you that, this originality, it shows you that even a half a century later in its sort of unspoiled state th through the meaning of photography. And um, the thing that has really changed by that time is of course our own, your own awareness um, of what, what has happened since then. And um, I think that's part of the magic of photography that you sort of, um, you know better, but um, it's still there somehow. And um, um, and this is what fascinated me with uh, photography from the beginning. But I had never actually had a camera in my hands. So I was mainly, all my thinking happened via um, pictures that had been taken by other people. And although today I know how to handle a camera, I have more than, I think more than 50 cameras by now, I still don't consider myself a photographer. Um, um, I'd be much easier as a sort of philosopher um, thinking about a picture that I'd find somewhere or it could be on the internet or anywhere in fact. And it usually um, I find it when I'm not looking for it. Um, and of course when I know that I don't have to look for it then I try not to look for it and then I will surely not find it. So it's always a sort of game of hide and seek with um, the perfect picture that gives you a signal of what uh, the next piece could be. So that's essentially how I work. And I will start by um, a work called Bordeaux Piece, which I produced during the summer of 2004. Um, but I thought it out in the winter of 2003. And um, I'm starting with this work because it kind of explicitly relates to architecture. And but in the same time, it's also the story of a sort of I um, incidental or accidental encounter with a house. And the house that I um, came upon was a house by Rem Kolas. I think it's one of his best known private villas in France, in Bordeaux. And I was invited by the owner of the house, who I met on a dinner at the collector's place in Brussels. And she said, what do you do? I said, I'm an artist, I work with film. And she said, well, I, um, I have a house by a very famous architect. And do um, and you know it? I said, no, I don't know it. I saw her looking at me. And I'd already done my speech about architecture by that time. And she said, OK. So he doesn't know it. And so next, the week after that, I went to visit her. And um, well, I'm kind of keen on new adventures, so on things that I don't know. 
Um, and, and it was in autumn light that I visited this house. And I was kind of critical at the moment when I went in there because I saw as a place that's only eight years in age how crumbling down it came already. And I thought, ah, oh, bad engineering, probably fancy, but uh, you get tired of it after a while. And um, But I stayed, uh, I think, one and a half days and long enough to appreciate um, the sunlight that um, comes in and around the house and the way it articulates the whole space and actually gives um, creates different, really different rooms depending on the time of the day. And when I noticed this, this kind of came together with, uh, with an idea that I was running in my head at the time, which was something else that I'm very suspicious of. So I'm not so suspicious of architects, but I'm mainly suspicious of filmmakers, cinema. And, and the way um, cinema dictates much of what we do and w the way we think. This is mainly my, um, uh, the thing that uh, worries me most sometimes. And I had this vengeance piece in my head, which was um, a short film that would appear like a piece of cinema with two or three actors. And that was actually playing against the backdrop it could be any backdrop, but the backdrop had to be um, an articulation of the movement of the day, the passing of the day, um, on this location. And being sort of um, impressionist uh, in mind at that time, um, and, and really adoring light and light changes, and, and, and being able to sit a whole day to observe, I thought, well, maybe I might apply this idea to this house and so um, I started uh, I visited the place uh, the house in Bordeaux several times studying the light and the way it, the light moves around the house and maybe you might know that the house was initially designed for somebody who had lost his mobility somebody who was in a wheelchair and so light is a sort of spectacle of the world around him um, and it had to, um, it was actually what had to, it had to work like a film. It had to, I could feel that there was a cinematic intention in the way, in the way the place was built. It had to be spectacular at any moment of the day for the people who lived there. And so I came up with this short story of three people. And the short story would last for about 10 minutes. And I actually didn't care about what was being said or what happens, um, but the short story for me was like a kind of foreground event, something that happens right in your face. It's the first thing you see when you switch on television and you, or you go to a movie. You see people, blah, 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 talking. And there's this kind of psychological realism going on, which I always so despise. And I, um, I use that as a kind of foreground. The background became this um, compositions, which I had by then um, figured out in and around the house, where the time of day is articulated as at its best. Ideally, of course, in winter time, because the sun is lower and creates the sort of more uh, richer palette of colors and shadows. And um, but of course, winter time is a bit hard and weather very unpredictable, which is what I thought. So I decided to shoot it in summer. Big mistake. Summer at the um, Atlantic coast can be as um, unstable as winter. And you can read there that the film lasts about 13 hours and 43 minutes, which is a bit hard for to ask for anybody to sit out. Um, but it kind of uh, keeps um, that in mind, I think, in the sense that it's about, if I forgot exactly, but I, I think it's around 70 short films that last each around 10 minutes. They're all a little bit different in length. But what they have, um, what's essential is that the actors, the three actors in the piece, um, reenact every line, 
every scene um, each 10 minutes later in the day. So they just perform the same thing, the same words, the same kiss, the same despise, but 10 minutes later in the day. So they don't actually um, are aware of that themselves, but I think, I imagine the, uh, the, the, the actors must have felt secondary when they were doing so, because they were doing nothing else than the marathon of acting, repeating and repeating and repeating. So there was no sleep, no rest, uh, no breaks. Every 10 minutes we were shooting another scene. And in that sense, light and form dictated everything. So there are a few stills here which I put together like this um, in order to illustrate the scenario. It starts with a, a man, uh, he's a film producer, and he, um, he's on the phone and he explains uh, to his uh, girlfriend that he needs to go off uh, to Berlin and that he wants to have a naked woman in the picture because naked women represent good money. Second is the lover of the girl, so obviously they both have an affair, who is the son of the father, just to make things a little bit complicated, you know, and, and of course uh, cheaper. And the son calls up the girl and she pretends she is in another place. She doesn't know he's walking towards her. And uh, she's asking, where are you? And he's asking, where are you? And at one point he realizes she's having, she's there with his father. So um, he's kind of crossed and they don't say much. Um, but the whole conversation is meant to be avoiding, in fact. It's meant to be uh, just bringing you to the next composition. And um, so it's kind of lazy and boring in a way. And you can see that composition and light dictates everything from these few stills. And then it goes on. He goes up and talks to his father on the first floor and has an argument. And um, the father gives him an envelope and says, um, he actually throws it right in front of him so that he has to grab it as a sort of uh, intimidation um, effect. And uh, then the father goes off. And that's more or less the end of the film. It ends with where it begins, uh, a view over the city of um, the River Garonne in Bordeaux. And this film is then, uh, when it finishes, um, it's, it's, so it's of course turned in real time, uh, recorded in real time, so um, the, f the, s the whole scene lasts 10 minutes. And then, of course, they have to start immediately with a new film. And I, I, maybe it's a little bit, uh, I'm not sure if I should show you, well, I, I might, but um, I'm going to, I think I'm going to show you an illustration of what the result is when, um, oh yeah, these are the stills again, what the result is when you take out uh, three seconds of each film and edit them after one another. So I'm not going to show you the piece immediately, but I'm going to show you uh, a sequence of how an actor gets tired in front of a backdrop which is ever-changing. So here actually I deploy just my eye as a photographer and um, I compose and Ram Kolas himself found it rather uninteresting uh, what I had done. I think because of course I use the publicitary effect of uh, what you can do with the house and with the light, or well, maybe not so much the light but uh, mainly I use the transparency of the, of the window walls and then the backdrop. And there's a lot of nature involved. There's a lot of green around it. And there's, of course, also a lot of birds in the soundtrack. Because the birds were an essential part of the film. There was the soundtrack was divided in two. It's divided in stuff that you can hear in the headphones um, and things that you hear through speakers. And the headphones have the music, uh, so soundtrack, of course, it's cinema, and um, so we need to uh, shed a tear at the end, and it has, of course, the dialogues. And the birds are just actually the witnesses. They, they, they were a real-time recording of the birds from morning till evening. So now I show you four-second sequence, and just bear with me for a few minutes. 
I am leaving for Berlin in half an hour. Me? I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. You call me. I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. You call me. I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. Around six in the morning. Mm. You call me. I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. Mm. For me, I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. Mm. Me, well, I'm, I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. Yes. Me, I'm, I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. Mm. Me, I'm leaving in half an hour for Berlin. Yeah. Now you call me. I'm leaving for Berlin in half an hour. Yeah. What me? I'm leaving. You for can Berlin. see the light progressing from mm. left to right. You call me. What me? I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. Mm. What me? I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. Hmm? Me. I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. Yes. What? I'm I'm leaving for Berlin. In half an hour. <laughs> what? Me. I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. Hmm? Hmm? Me. I'm leaving for Berlin. In half an hour. Yeah. What? Me, I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. Hmm. <coughs> what? Me? I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. Yes. What? Me? I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. Yes. Hmm? What? Me, I'm, I'm leaving for uh, Berlin. Half an hour. What? Me, I'm leaving for Berlin. In half an hour. Hmm. What? Me, I'm, I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. What? Me. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaving for Berlin. Half an hour. No. What? Me? I'm leaving for uh, Berlin. Half an hour. Mm. What? Me? I'm, uh, I'm going off to, to Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> so this illustrates my sweet revenge on cinema and on actors. And I have to say, they, uh, I mean, the people involved were, of course, very generous. Uh, because, um, but I remember that uh, Josse de Pau, who is an actor and who actually also wrote, helped me, or actually he wrote the, 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 the dialogues, uh, said at the end of the first day, um, he said, David, uh, this is the way to kill an actor. You know, it's uh, this repetitive. This sort of, um, it's a kind of, you know, I'm thinking, of course, I work with digital media, and, and this is I'm really fond on them. I've never was a big fan of working with um, analog. Um, I always my dream was always to scan my entire archive and to have everything digital. And, but still, this is a sort of uh, analog uh, revenge as much as you can have it on. Uh, and so, of course, the, the work goes on, and obviously it's never shown in its ideal situation in museums or galleries because the prettiest moments are the, the morning and the evening. The never, galleries is never open on these days, so it's like um, it, the story just goes on there. And um, I'll, I'll show you a few uh, production pictures. I work usually with a very small crew, I work on a budget, of course, and um, this is the advantage of not having been trained the religion of cinema, is that uh, you can sort of do everything. You do it a little bit less good, but you do it anyway. And um, I work with a small crew also on this production. We were just, um, um, well, we did, each, each of us had two jobs at least. Uh, I was cameraman, for example. Uh, director as well, and probably the cleaning lady sometimes as well. And um, the actor was actually sound guy too. And it's basically we spend a, a bit more than a month on location, and then another two weeks preparing on location. 
And here, uh, José de Pau comes out of his uh, room. He was writing a novel at the time. And I'd promised him peace and quiet. And of course, uh, that was not really what happened. Um, but he nevertheless did it. And here he's on, w on one of the walls, which he, we had to um, double in size because um, he's afraid of heights and it's a little bit risky otherwise. This is the opening, this is where you come in, the gate. And um, there were long stretches of pause as well because some in some um, shots there was shadow or shade because of the clouds and that meant that uh, this, this would not be in sync with the sun. And uh, so you can't have one shot in the clouds and the next one will go into, into the sun. So this had to be radically a sunny picture. And so we had to redo some of the shoots and this took us another sort of two weeks to assemble the puzzle of everything. And uh, quite amusing in the end, in the last shot, I'd said we, we film from sunrise until sunset and plus one uh, scene with the lights on. And the lights on is of course an homage to the crew because the entire crew, as it is a, 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 a house with a lot of windows and at night the crew becomes very um, reflected, as reflected as the actors. So the last one is a little bit about how it's all done. But nobody ever gets to see it, of course. Long stretches of pause. And to make things a little bit worse, I did another film in the, with the same principle a year later, but then during winter, almost on the same location. This is actor being tired. This is me waiting for sun. And then the video excerpts. But I think, you know, if I have the time later, I can go into those, maybe show one, but um, I'd like to uh, go on to another work which I've done rather recently. Praveen talked about it a moment ago, it's Sections of a Happy Moment. And it's a very different piece. And this must be... I sometimes work in series which um, which will be small series because the production is rather uh, extensive. It, I'm, I'm really very impatient, but um, you wouldn't think from the stuff that I do, but I really am. And um, another proof of that is Sections of a Happy Moment, which I completed in 2007, but I started it about one and a half years earlier. And... Um, it's a single channel installation, one could say, which is uh, 25 minutes and 57 seconds. And it's black and white. And I, it's set in, um, in, a, in a, a building complex by a Belgian architect um, named Renat Bram. He is uh, probably the most important exponent of Belgian modernism. Everybody hates his buildings in Belgium nowadays, of course, but um, they are uh, in the process of renovating the, um, the place and it actually really looks good. And I, I use this uh, setting because I was looking for something entirely different and it was the only place um, that was close to my studio. I don't like to go out far if I don't have to. It was the only place that was close to my studio and that really um, represented the or embodied the modern spirit of social housing in a way that I was looking for. And uh, in, in the idea, so I have to say maybe a little bit more about the concept of the piece, a few things came together. Um, I was thinking about China essentially when I started with the piece and I was thinking about a duality which comes back often in my work between um, intimacy and observation between those things which are for which you are so close to your nearest um, that they could not be sort of uh, captured by uh, observation or a, or a, how you say it uh, closed circuit cam uh, camera CCTV 
and that they, that they could not be captured by a controlling organism. This was mainly what was in my head. Um, and this tension between the very small, those very in intimate and the very large, uh, let's say the sort of uh, state organ that controls and distributes everything, was the starting point. And um, so these two things which do not really, which are kind of feeling compatible, are often things that get me going for a piece. And I, I like to bring them together on a seemingly conflictless surface. And um, here you can see the, the, the installation. Um, I think this must have been in Vancouver or at the Centre Pompidou, I'm not sure. Installed at the, in the right uh, with another piece called the stack, which I'd made now 13 years ago. And um, this is another installation view. This is in Vancouver, so, so it, it varies in size, but the grander it can be projected, the better. These are a few stills, of which there are in a total about 180 photographs of a single moment in time. And um, I like that as a spectator, you get the message, or at least one part of the message, rather quickly, and that is this is a construct. This is not um, sort of uh, what I always say, the mutual authentication between the camera and the thing that happened. It can't be, it could never have happened. You could not possibly have had 180 um, pictures being taken at the same moment. So, I mean, later I did, um, in the series that I did later, I did each time more than 500 stills of the same moment. So it became even more elaborate than this. And um, technically, the, the piece I mean, has its shortcomings, but it does the job in sort of um, um, exhausting the, how much you can do composition-wise with the location and with the, a simple situation. And the situation is a boy and a girl playing with a ball and surrounded by their parents and grandparents. And a few people uh, w who are onlookers standing by and because the the film goes on and on during almost 26 minutes there is of course a sense of continuity that settles in despite the fragmentation that you feel inside of you as because you read photography but because it's a film or maybe you could say a digital slideshow plus there is a soundtrack, there it is also inscribed into some kind of ongoing thing. So that is another duality between the still and, and the thing that progresses in time. And by doing so, the objects, I call them objects, but they're in fact people, change their statute. They change from people being photographed in a moment in time, to objects that more resemble sculptures, that more resemble parts of the architecture in a way, parts of the static thing, parts of the surrounding. And as such, they change the kind of feeling of material. And this was what I was interested in, that they would no longer be people of flesh and blood, but maybe become people like the building, uh, or objects like the building. And um, somehow um, architecture really uh, gets me going when it comes to photographing. I love, um, I love shooting and, and trying to put myself in the architect's brain and, um, and see so, um, realize sometimes how amazing it must have been at the time, um, 60, 70 years ago, to plan a building that and have all these virtual spaces in your head with not with the tools that exist uh, today. And so I think I might I'm going to show you a small excerpt of the video.
so it's just a short piece. Um, the soundtrack is some kind of bottleneck, and um, sometimes it happens that um, you, you're editing uh, late at night and um, some music is on. And I'm kind of keen on generic music or music, elevator music, as they say, because it it pretends to be something it's not. It's a sort of a weaker version of uh, music. And um, it doesn't have high or lows. It doesn't have climaxes, really. It just goes on forever. But what it does, and that's the most important, it does its job at as being a representing a continuity. The opposite of what photography would be, um, a, a freeze of a moment. And um, so that's for sections of a happy moment, essentially, maybe a few more pictures of the way I have made the work. And I said in the beginning I often wor use uh, triggers to give me ideas, and this is the picture which uh, gave me the idea. It's something I'd found, I don't know, I guess in the library. Um, and initially the, the piece was called Rope Skipping. It was going to be like this. But then I felt that the girl um, being lifted up from the, from, the, from the ground just represents too much the index of, as an index of m proof of movement. And um, it kind of breaks the laziness that I wanted to have in the whole setup. So I transferred that to the ball. The ball is act then one, is the only object that's actually floating plus the two elderly people which are never allowed to sit down in their chair. They're always mo always busy um, moving. And I've done this kind of small little uh, things in, in other works as well. Um, and then a few pictures of uh, the archive, c which come from the archive of Renaud Bram, so I'm not sure if I'm allowed to show them or whatever, but this is... Uh, early on when the complex was finished. It's actually really ma magnificent. It feels very uh, light and very still today. But it's of course now filled up with um, urban, urban sprawl, full of little individual houses, um, which is, uh, well, which gives you uh, a, um, a real sense of what people actually think about it. They never attempted to reproduce this kind of housing in the neighborhood ever again. And then these are some stills. Which, so I studied all this and of course the light, the moment when the light again is uh, very important. And then of course I always make sketches. This was here still with the idea of doing something sportive. And then that quickly progressed to the rope skipping. And then the situation sketches of very concretely already. This is uh, these drawings I made them when I knew already exactly what the piece was going to be like. And drawing is about the only thing that I retain from my sort of academic uh, training. I'm far too good painter to still paint. <laughs> and then this is the. Uh, studio at that time it was very I just moved into a new studio and uh, so it was all kind of primitive we were just helping ourselves with whatever we could use and um, more drawings and then some screenshots here you can see that the scenario still looked rather different this was still with the girl being suspended in the air and then Here we already have the compositions ready. There was a lot of cleaning, digital cleaning, in the sense that you have the trees at once upon a time. The architect probably had planned as young trees and become adult trees. Now, of course, they were age-old trees. And uh, um, because I wanted to restore the place digitally to its original state, that meant photoshopping out each and every leaf on a tree and replacing them with young ones. This is Photoshop compositions, or actually it's After Effects, and all sort of things. So that's for um, Arena. I uh, would now like to move on to another piece, which um, I'm, 
I'm choosing, I'm picking out the, the works that have some kind of relation with architecture. Either they're set in architecture or I'm just inspired by it. And that piece is called Sunrise and it was in my, uh, the show that I had at Parasol Unit here uh, a few months ago. Plus it was also, I think, included in my gallery show at Hauser and Weert at Piccadilly Circus in 2009. And this work um, is an old idea for which it took me a long time to find a location to film it. And uh, I, uh, five years to be precise. And uh, sometimes one has to be patient. And the idea came actually together with, with, at the time when I did Bordeaux piece, but I said to myself, I cannot possibly shoot two different um, I, uh, concepts in a single building. That would be too much of an homage to Rem Colas. And so I was looking for something else. And at one, one day I found a book in the library on um, uh, it was private architecture in England, I think it was. And then there's an architect named um, Graham Phillips, who I'm not sure if he's still, but he used to be the um, associé of uh, Norman Foster. And he had built this wonderful house for himself, privately, um, called Skywood House. And it's west of London in a small town, small village called Denham. And uh, what, you know what's so curious sometimes with really beautiful places is that, and the museums have that too. And I think there's, there's not one, not, it's not the only thing that they have in common, um, contemporary architecture and museums, is that they have, they don't take into account the sound situation. Denham, the house in Denham is located 100 meters away from an airport. So you have from seven o'clock in the morning, you have pe airplanes going up and there's a helicopter training base. And the house in Bordeaux is located on a hill. And um, if you go down the hill, uh, there's a highway passing by. So depending on the wind, you either sleep quietly at night or you don't sleep at all. So is this, and I, I, um, I'm kind of amused with how um, um, a theatrical, this uh, seems to have as an implication that um, the sound seems to be kind of secondary I with the way um, you can picture the location. And the picturesque is therefore much more dominant. And so maybe another word about sunrise as a, the main idea here too was a duality between um, the modern and the romantic. And I mean that both um, sophisticated, but also very simple, very um, uh, um, general. They're both um, parts of our history from which by now we think we know much more. And we are much, uh, we're cleverer than modernism and we are also cleverer than romanticism. So this kind of both represent ongoing um, phenomena in our culture um, over which we have some kind of power, at least historically that it's been written down. And um, I wanted to play these two phenomena out against one another. My belief is that um, we're still working very much, of course, with the remains. Um, well, they're actually not even remains, they're just active um, components of our culture. But at the same time, um, they're also museal in a way. They're kind of dug away when we want them. And therefore, I conceived the work, the film, in, in two chapters, a very dark part and a very light part. And the dark part is the whole um, first part of the film, which I show you some stills of here. And the idea of the work is that it's so pitch black that your eyes need to adapt to the darkness when you enter into the cinema or when you enter into the place where it's installed. So the walls are painted pitch black and the projection also happens on directly on the black walls in order to create a light which is very feeble. As if the whole situation it resembles a little bit like um, 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 a, a, a room in a museum full of 
fragile drawings that are about to fall apart, which are very dimly lit out. This was the idea. But in the, in the film, which is not much more than a choreography of a cleaning lady doing the household for wealthy people who can afford to live minimal and surrounded by nature, by choreographing her movements in such a way that she is beautifully imprisoned. Um, it's not at all about her. It's about what the camera does with the house and how it flirts with the way it's framing the house. And I, I consider this work a little bit like the epitome of what I've done with um, or my attraction to architectural photography, which is all about symmetry and trying to find things that you know you wouldn't usually see so easily but with the camera you do and the the subject of the, the work as i said is about this cleaning lady but she works in utter darkness there is no light except for a moment when um by the way all these pictures are largely overexposed um, except for a moment when the owner of the house goes to the loo and switches on the light briefly and then switches it off again and so this is a little bit of funny thing in the in the in, in the work that your eyes adapt and she's just doing her job in the middle of the night she's bringing in the wood here the owner goes to the toilet then she's cleaning the windows inside and out and here i play with the um, mirroring effect of course of uh, light on, on glass and the transparency here she's on the inside there she's on the outside you both have her reflections and finally there's a shot on the outside which goes over a lake which is lies in front of the um, or a pond actually which lies in front of the house and just to give you an illustration of how theatrical the whole house has been conceived the pond is not just water on the soil, it's an actually a pitch black foil which is um, stretched over on, on the, f uh, the bottom of the pond which makes the, the water look pit pitch black. The house itself is very white, which of course um, the weather, the climate in England doesn't really allow for the white to stay very long. It becomes um, green with moss and starts to deteriorate quite quickly. But the architect had found a solution for that. He had um, um, made a, a slight inclination on top of the walls, which meant that um, the rain would always um, um, go down on one particular side. So um, he would have the walls painted white once a year on one side, and every second year, if I remember, on both sides. So as in order to save um, some work, and there's a lot of square meters of white wall there. And here my, uh, my maid we, um, gets a break. She uh, lits up a cigarette. And there's another, again, another occasion to just frame her in front of a house, in front of white plains and darkness. And this is then more or less the end where she brings out the garbage, still neatly composed. And all of this is not filmed with high quality equipment. This is just filmed with, you know, proper amateur equipment and a good cameraman and you know, some good guys just having uh, a lot of fun for a week. And so after she dropped the, lug the, the garbage, she does the final arrangements in the house, makes the coffee, puts the table, waits for the coffee to be ready and then goes out. And um, and that's the end of the film, where actually the second chap chapter, the romantic part, starts. Um, that's the beginning of her day, coincides with the ending of her work day. So it's kind of free time um, at the end of the movie. And I think the second feeling that I had in me with, with, with what I wanted to do with the work was to um, create conflicting sentiments about what is the beginning and what is the end. And as such, this goes back to, uh, it links back to the modern and the romantic, which is actually 
having um, the say at the moment or which is the beginning and which is the end. And this also coincides with a piece of beautiful piece of Rachmaninoff music which just lasts very shortly for I think 50 seconds and she just drives into the sunlight away to her village. And basically that's it. So it's essentially a quiet movie where you might want to fall asleep and at the end a wake up call and uh, it's Rachmaninoff. But what it does ultimately, it delivers uh, a sensation, I hope, I, 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 I think, um, of something which is not entirely resolved. Something for which no sides have been taken and for which actually um, you don't know which is the dominant uh, factor really in the film. And that's what impo what's important, is that you don't choose sides, is that you let um, you let the two fighting factors speak with one another while not saying a, saying a thing at all. This is, I'm very keen on that. A few images of how I came to find the house in Denham. I searched about everything, both uh, historical modernism and contemporary architecture. And... Um, Deso, I don't know where that is, I think that's Spain, no that's, um, I think this is uh, in uh, Czechia. And then I found, ultimately I found Denham, a place which is by nature very theatrical as you can see, the way it's built, it was often used for commercials and for films, naturally. So it kind of, for me, it represented the ideal spot. It was, uh, on one hand, referring to Miss van der Rohe and to uh, uh, modernism, and on the other hand, it was a remake of that with almost more obsession than the real thing. But I learned a lot... Uh, from living um, for a while in both places. It was very interesting to see how um, cinematic um, an experience it can be if you are invited in, a, in this special spectacular houses and you stay there for a while and you can see differences in depth in um, already alone, the, w the location of course, England, the weather is different, the light is different, it's much more capricious. You have diff three different seasons in a day, etc. In Bordeaux, it's the light is very different. And then again, the storyboard is, of course, as in Bordeaux piece, it's mainly a pretext for the um, the camera work. And these are the production stills on location. We prepared most of the thing of the shots during the day and filmed at night. But some of the shots had, of course, uh, um, the windows and such reflections that we um, sometimes were forced to shoot during the day or during dusk. This is at night, one of the last shots, again with a very small crew. was freezing cold and the heating was broken. That's my crew, so very small. Me playing the guy who opens the door. And of course, the use of these lengthy track shots, which uh, if you combine them with tele, it's a very, um, very uh, interesting. And this was the cover of my latest book. So I would now go on to the work that I'm, um, that's in progress, of, uh, to which I'm working right now. And it's a very, very different story again. 
since a few years, I um, I have um, well being encouraged by my, the people I work with, my assistants who are all artists um, and self-taught uh, geniuses, and to to go over to another way of working and slowly introducing computer-generated uh, or CGI imagery. And when we think of computer-generated imagery, we often think of autom automation in photography, but that's quite the opposite. It's very laborious. And um, while photography still um, uh, confronts you to a world into which you have to intervene, CGI means that you have to invent everything from scratch. So it questions your sort of um, capacity as a filmmaker uh, or as a photographer to uh, imagine uh, the existing world. And there the problems start, of course, because you f the first thing you do is you fall into cliches. Nothing you will create actually exists. You make everything from scratch. And fortunately, sometimes I do have very concrete ideas. And this piece has just been finished. It's the Oil Workers, it's a long title, Oil Workers of the Shell Company of Nigeria Returning Home from Work Caught Up in Rain. And um, it's an animation and the duration is not specified because it's an infinite loop. The, the title is important because it kind of um, poisons the image. It's about oil. It's about oil and about shell. And of course also about water because they are caught up in rain. And I started from a picture that I'd found, again somewhere I don't know exactly where I would have to trace it back, but it just arrived in my archive. And since a number of years I wanted to do something about um, the idea of the African continent and how its state is. And by that I mean how photography is in fact in a miserable situation there because this, the, um, it always, photographers always come back with the same cliches of poverty, drought, misery, war um, and conflict. And I didn't want to embark on that. And uh, of course rain um, sort of provides the ideal opening up for uh, a narrative which creates a tension between the oily, sticky surface and the water or humidity. So I started studying uh, the relations between water and oil in photography. And the first pictures were quite clear, but here it becomes less obvious which is oil and which is water. And so this fascinates me, um, the sort of um, you know, a moment ago I was speaking about impressionism, but actually what um, materials do to you, um, even in a virtual environment like the internet or like uh, um, digital photography or digital film, is they do actually send very concrete messages. Oil, water, reflection, things like that, light, these are very sort of sensorial memories. And I kind of like to work with those. And so I started making an animation very roughly. We call that a, 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 um, a clay model of figures on their motorbikes and then a few figures in the background to see which movement might work for the piece. This is, of course, looks ridicule, but it gives an idea of, um, of the speed and whether the project is at all worth embarking upon or not. Then to go on, I built um, in my studio a big scanner. I call it a scanner, but it's actually not a scanner. It's just a, a group of cameras, 25 to be precise, which are all synchronized and they uh, shoot at the same moment. It's a lot of photographic material to work with, but what I do with it afterwards is all these uh, photographic, all this photographic source material is being fed to a computer and to a program which makes out of it a 3D model. So here you can see 
one of my, we call them oil workers, it's a little bit disrespectful, but it's one of the figurants that um, uh, pose one by one. And this is then a resulting um, figure already with the textures on him, but he's still lifeless. There's no animation in the eyes. The skin looks dead, it looks mummified somehow. And this is then a quick animation of one of the guys on the motorbike. It still looks, as you can see, there's, and I'm fascinated up to this moment, I don't know yet how to explain, but there's a very concrete um, tactile uh, side to CGI. Everything always feels like some kind of material, because you don't have a reference for it. So in this case, it feels like rubber maybe, or something painted. And, um, and then here it starts feeling like something shiny, but not yet complete. And these are then the first figures inserted into the picture. More, until it becomes sort of populated. <coughs> and this is the resulting work, which will be not such a small picture, but which will be gigantic high definition uh, projection. This is also super compressed. So it's a little bit contrary to the, what I'm preaching about uh, materials here.
the movement of the camera slowly moves towards a, a still portrait which remains like that for a minute after which the camera goes continues its sort of um, elliptical movement and if you try to imagine the space it's rather impossible because the figures reappear on both sides of the road so there are um, if you stay a while you get a sense that they're going in no direction and could not possibly go in no direction because they're twice the same figures they're always repeating but what you miss here of course in this uh, compressed version is the eyes and the, and the expressions I tend to show this on a size which is at least uh, almost four meters high, so that you get about five meters wide or you're almost six meters wide. And a more or less life size dimension. Uh, I think the, the, the last piece that I would like to say something about is another work which is entirely not finished at all, um, but which is my oldest idea ever. I had it in 1994, and I always avoided making it because it had a component in it which... Um, which was very annoying. It's a piece of based on a piece of music that I once heard, and it's uh, it's relaxation music. So there I go again with the generic soundtracks, and it's music that's been written to for people in hospitals or in in saunas or in or elevators or whatever, or just to fo make you fall asleep. And uh, but I so much like the idea of and always had of the idea as a place for. Uh, of, of the museum as a place where you could sleep, where you can take a nap, and where it's uh, relatively quiet. And so, um, so actually 1996 to 2013, it's not 1994. Um, so it was a long time in the making, mainly because I didn't find the location where I wanted to shoot it. And I was also a little bit embarrassed about the music because it might mean the end of my career somehow. And But then last year I, I did buy the rights of the music and the um, um, author of the music was rather surprised. He thought everybody had forgotten about him. And he embarked upon a career as a contemporary composer and really wants to have nothing to do with what he did in his former life. And, and so it was a little bit odd because I wrote him a, a long letter about how, how great his soundtrack was. And uh, in fact it is. The, the, the quality of the soundtrack is that it... it, it um, so what, what does relaxation music? It does nothing else than to um, move you in different states, different mental spaces. No? It brings you from light to dark and then it wakes you up again at the end. It becomes light because you should wake up. You shouldn't eternally be asleep with the music so and he had written music like this you know to make to make you uh, have a power nap with some aid and um, the piece of music is about 12 minutes in length and it's called relaxation profonde in French which uh, is clear and it starts with um, it starts with this kind of sunny summery tune um, and I imagined it's somewhere in a park in the woods um, with a bench and with a small tree and nice weather, but maybe evening light. And it goes in a forest. <coughs> it starts with well, the forest, which is just the woods in the park. But soon after that, <coughs> they become more profound and dark and deeper. And, of course, the music goes to a kind of system where it is a, just a drone. Just and, obviously, you have to fall asleep. And um, I'm, I'm counting that there will a lot of be a lot of people offended by that fact that... Um, um, by this... Uh, no, um, how can I serve um, exquisite people such vulgar music? 
Um, but I'm convinced that you can actually do it with anything, as long as the images associated with it are right. And as such, the camera moves on deeper into the forest, <coughs> passes by a small river. The river, as maybe you can imagine what that might be, the sound of the river means slowly waking up. Then there's a triangle sound that means now you wake up. And then there is, um, uh, there is even a lake in the middle. It's really very deep and a valley. And at the end, the camera goes out of the forest again. But by then, you have um, space-wise, you have uh, the imagination in your head that you've been in a big forest with monumental trees. There's a lot of architectural references again in there. It starts, it's a work about the different measures and how you can actually um, uh, put them on their heads, if you want. And the music does so, and actually I just created the images for the music. And um, in the end, the camera goes out and the music sort of, in a kind of epiphanic mood, um, goes broader and bigger. And, ah, oh, yes, this was good. I'm awake again and can go on with my day. And it goes kind of upwards. The image literally does so too. It comes out of the forest and in a helicopter shot, we call it a helicopter shot, moves out of the forest and moves up about 200 meters above the earth. And it reveals the forest in its entirety. But what you see is that in the end, the forest reveals to be just a small bush, a group of 50 to 100 trees that have no significance whatsoever and that just are surrounded by urban, by roads and by villages and by things that I imagine it's somewhere in, in set in Flanders or nor north of France or maybe England, but England is a little bit too picturesque for it. should be boring. So it's both uh, an upgoing um, movement and a movement that actually brings you down. And this is what it's about. And because I, I couldn't find uh, a proper location for real and it didn't suit sort of my uh, imagination, I started to do this in 3D as well. And here you can see some early movement studies, again in the, the clay model, of um, the deepest part of the film. Uh, well, this is, it looks like snow, but it's going to be very dark. And these are, these are hour long discussions about how to design, how to build. Um, a location like that, and that's I, I, the, the the great part for me is that it really brings out um, all your sort of pictorial um, um, background you need it to in order to build something, and of course also you very quickly uh, are confronted with your own limitations in imagination. Basically, it was on the wall in the Manet show today again, he, where he says he doesn't have any imagination. And that's true, you only have, your imagination is something that works based upon the, the things that you um, are uh, seeing and, and living with. And then these are some stills of the more um, elaborate version. I think the diff, yeah, it's almost, it's not entirely photographic, it will always be kind of generic. But there is the real reason why I didn't film it on location is because um, forests are always very specific. The trees are either from there or from there or um, and I, I'm just um, I think I really like studio work so much that I and the control over the light and the sun and everything that I um, preferred actually to make it the generic forest as well in order to sync better with the music. And this is the point where the camera goes in. I can't show you the film because it's not ready. It takes about estimated seven months to calculate in the computer, day and night. And this is then a preliminary shot of a very deep scene. But as you can see, it's very light and it's not going to be like that. It's going to be um, a bit darker. 
And this is supposed to give you a sense of a deep valley somewhere inside the forest with a, a path, stairs moving down. And you have to imagine that this is all animation, huh? it's all moving forward camera. So it's like this camera that floats very eerie uh, without um, the camera operator. And then this is the completed picture of the uh, clay model that I showed you a, model a moment ago. But again, also there, we'll pull down the lights. It won't be so bright. And then the next scene is what I call the cathedral scene. It's just a, a lonely tree, abandoned tree in the middle of a forest, surrounded by huge scenes. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I should stop. <laughs> Trees. And then a river, small river, just a creek. Um, here it's not yet filled with water. We first built the entire um, riverbed and then um, literally have the water flowing into it. And th this is the clay model of the of the river scene. This is how it begins. I actually love these most. And then um, a silicone animation of um, of water. These are millions of polygons that takes forever to to film that. And then this is the sort of resulting effect of it. This is all calculated by a computer. And these are, yeah, it's really like opening up a tab. So what you do with CGI is um, you're both busy with architecture because you have to build up everything from the ground, but also with the basic uh, natural phenomena. The light uh, can't be tricked. You have to be aware of it. You have to... Um, it is such a craft that is, I, I, I truly believe that pictorially it's far more uh, complicated than w anything the Van Eyck brothers ever did. Um, but of course, what nobody knows to do in um, people who are skilled uh, painters or uh, draftsmen in CGI, they don't have the time to um, enjoy the art. So they're always busy producing something. and. Um, this is why you never have, or rarely have, great artists in, 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 that, in that domain. You have good craftsmen that you have. So that's for uh, travel. So and this uh, work will premiere in at the Moscow Biennial of this year, and oil workers will premiere at the Zharja Biennial of this year. And um, yeah, that's what I'm working on. I think maybe I should give, uh, if anybody has questions, shoot ahead, please. Thank you. Are there questions? Okay, I understand it. <laughs> How do you feel about parallax? Because it seems to be an awful lot of your, um, your concern centers on the very simple phenomenon of two things passing at slightly different speeds, and mm -hmm. at one point eclipsing or occluding, and then coming past, and this mm. seems to be a sort of crucial uh, phenomenon that, that triggers the effect, as it were. It's, it's interesting the way you describe it, of course, as a parallax is that they don't conflict, they create, they generate a third um, uh, presence, and um, I've always, uh, but actually it's more accurate than what I'm always saying as them being a duality, two things which we're not supposed to. Uh, live together and, and then do in the end then you see what comes out of them but that's of course um, I think really the energy um, that I'm hoping for comes out of of, um, of two non-conflicting um, worlds brought together and the non-conflict is essential 
because um, I always sort of imagine that uh, what we're trained with is that energy comes from um, comes from burning in one way or another. It comes from um, you gain energy by wasting it at the same time or by conflicting. Like imagine the combustion engine, um, the petrol engine and the internal combustion engine. It, there's always war going on somehow. When we speak about energy, there's always fighting going on. There's always fire somehow. And, um, and I, uh, more generally, I'm more interested in, 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 in an energy that's produced in a different manner not by having the different factions fighting against one another and this is what I've been trying all the time sometimes more literal than others and there's another work of which I didn't speak at all tonight which is the algiest sections of a happy moment where I had a bunch of birds and uh, Maghreb, Mag uh, Maghreb uh, uh, young men and elderly men standing together which was in fact a reference uh, but I shouldn't say that maybe to the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict and much, uh, uh, and 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 I tried to um, to have this um, resulting in um, an enduring um, a picture, not one which starts fighting, but what, not one in which you have to choose camps, but in which you. Um, create a space where uh, um, something else happens I don't I don't I'm not I'm not very accurate in describing what that would be but I mean, uh, but when you speak about fire um, and you also to do with the, wa the water flow um, it's often said in representations of entropy that you recognize the arrow of time by the direction of dispersal, which is a, a, a different kind of m motion from the circular parallaxing uh, el elliptical looping that you seem to. So that there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a movement which is in the arrow of time and entropic uh, to do with perhaps the dissipation and burning of energy. But there's another motion which you seem concerned with, which is a sort of orbiting, which simply reveals things in a, yeah. uh, a, a, a mobile stillness. But the orbiting um, provides you, of course, uh, with uh, an option that filmmakers never had, that the fourth wall is gone. You have actually the entire um, freedom of movement. Um, you don't have to hide the mechanism that stands behind you as a sort of uh, which which you do when you when you shoot something you always have the, the invisible wall behind you and with orbiting um, it's um, um, how shall I say it's kind of delusioning in a way because or disillusioning because you 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 reveal that there's no fourth wall and um, I'm just beginning right now to sort of discover what I can do with that, um, what the possibilities of that are, um, and it's really new to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, there are two. Can you describe the process of your piece, which I believe is called The Long Goodbye? The Long Goodbye. Yes. Uh, and my second question is, uh, can you see your work in um, following a little bit, um, uh, I mean, is your work inspired by Chantal Ackerman's vision of unfolding the time and also the kind of lack of hierarchy between the actor and the background being space and architecture? It, it should be influenced by Chantal, but it's not. And um, it, this is, I don't know, I, nowadays every generation forgets about the previous in one way or another. 
Um, but there's another thing. Um, um, I mean, when I see her her work, her early work especially, I'm, it's striking, of course. And uh, um, but she's she's in uh, she's in another camp or in another league. Um, she's really a filmmaker, filmmaker somehow, and she studied it, and I don't. So I'm I'm always going to be a little bit on the outside of that. Um, and the other thing you were asking about um, Long Goodbye, I, I could maybe show you a few things about that. Um, long Goodbye should be somewhere here. White House, Shadow Peace, no, it must be after that. Um, yeah, that's Long Goodbye. Long Goodbye is um, again made out of two speeds that are brought together on the same surface and one is a extreme slowing down of um, motion capture of, um, of, of a woman and the other is a speeding up of daylight passing uh, on the facade of a house and yeah here the film is playing but it goes from black to black I will go a little bit further and um, I don't know really why I made that piece. I think I made it because of uh, the thing that happens when she at one point waves goodbye. Um, because both of the, the whole speed is artificial. It feels, uh, on one hand, it feels very slow. Um, it feels like a slow motion, but at one point it's, um, uh, it, it ba uh, the balance is uh, gone and it goes over to uh, a speeding up of time. And before you know, it's pitch black, the evening sets in and and like it's very quickly, very quick darkness setting in. And um, this has to do with uh, her noticing your own presence as a spectator. And I think that was um, probably what um, made me decide to make this piece is that she would be aware, um, a little bit like in Manet, where you have, uh, I don't want to compare too much, but where you have, um, where you have the, the, the um, the figure um, being um, loaded with the consciousness of um, but this is of course also rhetorics with the consciousness of somebody looking at her or him and um, so where you have a theatrical sense of um, a figure in a picture um, and the awareness is both directions and this is a rich sort of uh, thema uh, in which I try to tap in this work and the way it was made is basically this is always very um, disenchanting I'm afraid um, it's a, a long track so we emptied swimming pool for it we found this house and I wanted to do something about the garden without showing the garden and um, so it's a very beautiful garden with these gigantic trees and then this is in the studio where I'm shooting woman and yeah these are some and then I, I if basically I photographed one still per second per centimeter so each second I move one centimeter backwards I regress one centimeter backwards and I um, take another still so that's the that was the, the dogma dogma in uh, in the work the way it was done so it it crosses 50 meters, I think it is, in in about nine hours or so. Yeah, it's but that's that's how it's done. Yeah, that's how the work was done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So